represents further splits between languages that occur over time. These splits typically occur when there's a population movement and there's no longer communication be between groups and then language change happens. So once the language, you know, once you had a unitary language, it splits into multiple languages. Um, so Semitic languages and other language families uh, offer a challenge to this model of language change as the Semitic peoples, they occupied a relatively small area with not many insuperable nat natural barriers. You know, they had rivers, not too many mountains in the Near East, except in Syria and places like that. Um, so um, there was always a lot of contact between the different languages. So, you know, for, for example, Arabic, which somehow is assigned to Central Semitic, which is a group of, uh, three language families, Arabic, Old South Arabian, that's an inscriptional language from the Yemeni area in the south of the Arabian Peninsula and Northwest Semitic. Northwest Semitic has many daughter languages. This is only a sample. Uh, Northwest Semitic goes down to Canaanite and Hebrew is an offshoot of, of uh, Canaanite. Now Canaanite is, uh, I'm going to come back to that. That's Unattest well, it's attested in a very interesting way. We, we have documents that, that seem to contain Canaanite. Um, but anyway, Arabic is associated now with Central Semitic. It used to be associated with languages like Ethiopic. The, the tree would look somewhat different, but um, the problem with Arabic, it's so morphologically rich, it shares features with all the other languages. Um, you know, every Every distinctive feature in another language, Arabic has a talent for ha having. It's really quite remarkable. Um, now, a striking feature of Akkadian is that by an early date, old Babylonian period, early second millennium BC, 1800, 1700, it had lost all the guttural sounds found in a language like Arabic to this day. These are sounds made in the throat by the action of larynx and pharynx, of the larynx, larynx and the pharynx, and they're, they're considered the phonetic hallmark of the Semitic language family. The, now, this fact that Akkadian lost all those sounds, and you can read them in an Arabic newspaper or hear them in Arabic me media today, indicate that a lot of Sumerians learned Akkadian, since Sumerians did not have these sounds. And generally, in a situation where adult, adults are trying to learn a second language, hard features like a, such as unusual sounds that aren't found in many other languages in the world are frequently dropped. This is somewhat speculative as we don't know, have much information on how native Sumerians learned Akkadian. Some did, how many did, we don't know, but the Sumerian did die out. And they, in their acquisition of Akkadian, they may, may have had a deep influence on the language. Another indicator is Akkadian is very unusual in Semitic. It puts the verb at the end of the sentence. Uh, like we say in English, the man kicked the ball, uh, you know, subject, verb, object. Um, and, and you know what the relative role, you know, is depending on of the man and the ball is their position with respect to the verb. If you come before you, you're the subject, the one doing the kicking. If you come after, you're the one being kicked. Uh, Akkadian doesn't do it that way. They say the man, the ball, hit, kicked. Um, so it's a subject, object, verb. That's what I mean by verb final. Um, the only other, there's another language in the Ethiopian family, uh, Amharic, which is the national language of Ethiopia, which is verb final as well, but it's very, very unusual in Semitic. Usually Semitic in Arabic and Hebrew, they begin with the verb, uh, kicked the man, the ball. That's, that's how, in, in the standard, there are variations, but the, the main uh, ordering type is verb, subject, object. So we know that it seems highly likely that Sumerian, and Sumerian was verb final, I forgot, excuse me, I forgot a, an, an essential fact. Some, Sumerian was also verb final, so it seems highly likely that the Sumerian speakers made, turned Akkadian from a verb initial like the other Semitic languages into a verb final language. So there, there's evidence of, uh, there was a lot of what uh, linguists call contact phenomena, is that Sumerian and Akkadian were mixed up for many centuries, spoken by the same people, and they just had influences on each other. Uh, Sumerian in the end was the loser, unfortunately, it just died out as a common language. Um, now, here are the different periods of Akkadian. 
the different dialects, excuse, excuse the quality of the graphic, uh, it's the best I could find on the web. Thank God for the web. Uh, but what you have is proto old Akkadian in 3000. Uh, that's hypothetical. We don't have any texts of that really. Uh, then 2400, we start to get texts all in Akkadian. Um, by the way, all these names and these charts, these are scholar, modern scholarly conventions. The Akkadians didn't have such terms um, and so on. You can see Assyrian and Bab Babylonian are the two major dialect areas, both with an old, middle, and neo. There's a little, Babylonian gets a late, uh, that reflects the Babylonian kingdom as being the last gasp of, you know, Akkadian political power before the Persians took over. But there's a, and there's also a poetic dialect starting out in the old Akkadian period with its own forms, and it turns into something scholars call standard Babylonian. The great Gilgamesh epic is written in standard Babylonian. Um, now, Akkadian, during this development, okay, during this whole period of time, Akkadian changed. It, for example, it exhibit, exhibits a phenomenon known from the development of Latin. Akkadian uses case endings to in, indicate the role of a noun in the sentence, as, as in Latin or Greek. Over time, these case endings disappeared. Universally in languages, it's a fact the ends of words tend to be lost in speech. People don't like to pronounce whole words, particularly when you have a strong stress, you know, in earlier in, in, on an earlier syllable. It happens again and again in languages, these case endings disappeared. Um, now, from a cultural standpoint, Old Babylonian, right there, did become the classical stage of the language as it was associated with the powerful Hammurabi dynasty of the 17th, 18th centuries. This was long remembered as the golden age. Um, I, this is a common phenomenon in, in languages with high culture. Later, Akkadian writers tried to imitate uh, the old Babylonian dialogue, dialect. That's what produced standard Babylonian over here. It was sort of an imitation of old Babylonian with, with differences. This is very similar to what Latin writers in Renaissance Europe did when they tried to imitate the classical Latin writers like Cicero and, uh, and uh, Julius Caesar. So Babylonians, they may not have had names for the dialects um, that, that you see on the screen. They did have a sense of linguistic history. They could look back and see a style, see a, a dialect they admired and try to imitate it. And, you know, the language was that Hammurabi spoke was good enough for these scribes to try to write like him. Of course, he was illiterate. He never wrote anything. He had scribes. But, uh, oh, an interesting fact, Hammurabi, was the best known Akkadian king, but he wasn't actually Akkadian. He, he came from a little known group called the Amorites. Uh, and, and we know that, I mean, there's no text that says Hammurabi was a uh, Akkadian, but his name contains a sound that is foreign to Akkadian. So uh, I, don't, I don't, don't have it, I can't, it's not on the slide, but the initial sound that H in Hammurabi actually represents the sound not represent, not present in Akkadian. Um, and, and so it proves that he was a non-Akkadian stock. It probably an Amorite raider managed to, uh, you know, move in and create the first dynasty of Babylon. But we, we do have some kind of handle on, of the linguistic complexities of the period. Um, there's even a case of a forgery where a later writer tried to make a legal document look older than it actually was. Um, that, that gives you a good idea of the depth of our knowledge of Akkadian, but you can do that. You can detect such efforts to backdate documents, if I can put it that way, by finding features that, that didn't occur in the period it purports to come from. And in Renaissance Europe, there was the famous case of the don donation of Constantine that sort of everything was ceded to the Pope by Constantine. And it was a Renaissance scholar, I think it was Lorenzo Valla proved that it was a forgery in the same way. It had linguistic features that were contemporary. They, they didn't come from the period that it purported to come from. But there's an example from Mesopotamia of the same sort. sort. Now, before I, there's a term, terminological problem with the name Akkadian. Um, the name of the language is Akadu. That's the native name. That's what they called it. If you happen to look into modern dictionaries of Akkadian, you will discover that the major dictionary of the language produced by the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago, which is still a going concern, 
It's called the Chicago Assyrian Dictionary. This always puzzles students. The project of the dictionary project, which began in the 1920s, was only completed in 2011. It was one of those, like the OED, Eternal Diction Dictionary Production Schemes. This one was relatively brief. It was only 90, 90, 90 years. And uh, the compiler stuck with the original name of the all the way through. The reason for this is the first sources excavated in the 19th century were Assyrian. And this was at Nineveh, uh, the Assyrian capital is right on, on the, uh, uh, the uh, Tigris. Uh, Babylonian sources came later, and, but the name of the language had, had stuck by that point. Scholars realized that there were, there were Babylonian sources and they realized they needed a cover term for both for the whole language and that was Akkadian named after Sargon's capital. Uh, and, but the uh, Chicago Assyrian Dictionary people never changed the name. Um, I guess it was for branding purposes or something. But it is a problem. As far as the decipherment goes, I won't spend a whole lot of time on it. Um, the Akkadian language began to rediscovered when Kostin Niebuhr in 1767, a Dane, was able to make extensive copies of cuneiform texts and publish them in Denmark. The deciphering of the text started Im immediately and bilinguals in particular, um, Darius's inscription, as I mentioned, were very important. Um, and since the text contained several ro royal and place names, isolated signs could be identified and were presented in 1802 by Georg Friedrich Grotefen. That's the gentleman on the left up there. By this time, it was already ev evident that Akkadian was a Semitic language. And the final, again, the lexical similarities were striking. Uh, the word for God is ill. In Hebrew, it's ale. In Arabic, it's Allah. Um, Elahun is divinity. Uh, the, um, the word for a thousand is alf, in Hebrew it's elif, in Arabic it's, it's alf. 